So everybody, I'm I'm super excited as always because we have got this dynamic duo that is joining us again on the Flower Podcast. Welcome Steve and Sarah back to the Flower Podcast. Hey Scott, thanks for having us. Good to be back. Well, I have um, been following, as always, you guys are doing so many great things. For people that may be new to our podcast, let's do, we're going to let, we're going to put links in our show notes and on our webpage so you can hear the two great episodes that we've already done with you guys. So today is all new, all kind of exciting stuff going on, but give us a snapshot where you are, what you're doing and, and what kind of farm you've got. Okay, so we are going into our 13th season. We're here in northwestern Washington, almost on the border of Canada, almost in the water. We're right in the corner of the United States. And we have a farm where we grow dahlias, and it's beautiful, and we love being there and getting to live the flower-filled life there. We sell dahlia tubers. We sell uh, tissue culture-rooted cuttings, and we do dahlia education and farm education. So um, we have an online community where people can join and learn more about um, hybridizing dahlias and um, growing dahlias and doing all kinds of things about being um, good growers. And then in the middle of all that, we have our a legacy program where we teach, or we don't teach our legacy program, we learn from our legacy <laughs> program members who um, have been hybridizing for a long time. We represent them and do our best to grow out tons and tons of their dahlias and distribute them. So that's it in a nutshell. That's great. That's awesome. Well, one of the things I was super thrilled about having this conversation with you is I know myself, like a lot of people have all of a sudden found themselves owners of dahlia seeds, thanks to Aaron and Florette and all of this. And I know that you guys have grown dahlias for a long time. You're really great at doing it. And so I thought, you know, what a great opportunity to start and talk about how do we start dahlias from seeds? I know I did a little bit, a little, I think I did literally maybe, I don't know, 20 plants I started from seed a couple of years ago. And yeah, and I, and I, and I have, we moved and I, none of them were worth me really like caring about. So <laughs> they, they, they're still down there somewhere, but, um, now I have all these new seeds and I wanted to start them and I thought, oh, this is a great opportunity to learn more about how to do that. So um, can you walk us through some of these steps about starting dahlia seeds? Sure. Well, one of the coolest things about dahlias is that they don't come true from seed. To get a dahlia to reproduce itself as a clone, you either take a cutting, an herbaceous cutting of it, or you divide its tubers. But if you save its seeds, then there is incredible genetic diversity in those seeds. and Every single dahlia that you love, Scott, or that I love, or every named dahlia that we have, once it was a seedling in a hopeful gardener's dahlia patch. Somebody planted it as a seed and they got this amazing product. And so we say that planting dahlia seeds is maybe our greatest adventure. I don't know, parenting is probably our greatest. Okay, marriage. Okay, never mind. We're not going to talk about greatest adventure. <laughs> Being it's married cheapest, to your business partner. No. <laughs> it's the best way to play the lottery. Play yeah. Yeah. dahlia seeds. It's, in, it's just amazing the incredible diversity that you can get. Um, so uh, dahlia crosses matter for the kind of dahlia seeds. So your, your source of your seed is really important. If you're going to save seeds from your own dahlias, which um, I think I gave you a link, Scott, so we won't talk a ton a lot about that. It's just like saving seeds from any other flower. You let them go for the season and you collect them at the end of the season. And um, there are gonna be mixes of the dahlias that you have in your garden. So um, I feel like we, uh, recently I heard someone complaining, oh, I got a packet of dahlia seeds and they were all yellow. And that's probably because the person that they bought them for or the, from or the company they bought them from had a really diverse field and yellow is a pretty dominant color. Red's also a pretty dominant color. So when we save seeds from our dahlias, we are doing it in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that most people, um, so there's this, there's this conversation I frequently have with a couple of our uh, uh, growers in our legacy program and they, 
they're very careful about how they plant their plants and how the distance that they put their water lilies from their ball forms and their ball forms from their dinner plates. And when we get seed from them, it if they give us seed from their water lily growing uh, section, most of the time we get water lilies from those seeds. Every once in a while, it'll be a little weird and it's not always perfect like you want the water lily to form. But generally, if they give us seeds from their pom-pom breeding patch, we get pom-poms from those. And that's because they've done generations of selecting for that. So one of the ways we do it in our farm is that we don't have lots of open-faced dahlias in with our other dahlias if we're saving seed. And so some people get very technical. There's um, Christine Albrecht is an amazing example of this where she's done, she's dug into the science of how to hybridize dahlias and she's working towards very specific colors and she's super successful at it. She has, if you grab any of her books, she's not paying me to say this. I'm just saying that her books are amazing textbooks. Yes. For how to hybridize dahlias. You know, she's got her tools that she recommends, her processes. She's very specific. So um, you don't have to be that specific to get a good product though. Yeah. And that's, and this is the same. I was going to mention Erin uh, and Chris at Florette. She is intentionally saving seeds from a mix and then she's grown those out and she's pretty good. I can't think of too many people better than uh coming from beginning to end and so then when she releases something when you get seeds from her I mean, you can see this on her youtube or her instagram you, you know what you're going to get because they're coming pretty close to what she's showing you she shows you the diversity you're going to get but if you get her bees choice mix she purposely is giving you dahlias that bees are attracted to because of that open center they can get the nectar and the pollen easier so you know what you're going to get there's no mystery uh, about the form and of course eight set of chromosomes, you're going to get a little variety, which is part of the magic and the beauty of uh, why we grow. I think I sent a link to you, Scott, too, if you want to include it. I wrote an article called The Art of Saving Dahlia Seed that talks about how different hybridizers do it. And But once you have those seeds and you're in spring and you're ready to plant, you've got what you've got. So there's no more of that. We're just moving on to the planting part of it. <laughs> and, you know, I think the easiest analogy for people who are familiar with growing other flowers is to plant them like zinnia seeds because they're so sensitive to cold. You don't want to start them too early. We're just about to start our first round. Most years we plant 40 to 50,000 dahlia seeds at our farm. So um, wow. we, we aren't too late. We can't help ourselves. Yes. <laughs> we shouldn't do that. That's too many, but. Well, we are looking for beautiful hybrids to, we have quite a few really beautiful hybrids. Um, we're just sort of saving those till the time is right. We have too many other people's amazing creations. We're going to make sure that we do a good job representing yeah. them. And then if nobody gives us some new ones to introduce, <laughs> then we'll start trickling ours in. Well, it is such a fun hobby. We, we can't help ourselves, like you said, but I think we see ourselves more as, at least at this time in our lives, as connectors. Yeah. Or, you know, mm -hmm. we want to help other people. We want to equip other people to share beauty more than we just want to share our own beauty. So anyway, we're having fun growing lots of them. But what I'm saying is we have a lot to do, but we're not too late. Um, so just like a zinnia, you don't want it to go outside until after frost. So that means with a dahlia, you can either carefully prepare your soil and then direct sow it after all danger of frost when the sun has warmed your soil to between 60 and 70 degrees. I find a sweet spot right around 70, but if your soil gets really hot, plant them earlier. They do not like to be started super hot. We use, in our greenhouse, we use just the ambient temperature, sometimes a little bit of bottom heat. We plant them in a, in a whether it depends on what size, what we're doing. Sometimes we plant them in a six pack or in a four inch pot. And we um, just cover that seed just about half an inch deep, water it and it sprouts. One difference between dahlia seeds and zinnia seeds is that dahlia seeds can take a lot longer to sprout. They, you know, some of them are just journey on the spot. They pop right up, but um, I've learned not to throw out the ones that don't come up in a week or two because they'll come up and sometimes they're the most beautiful ones we get. Yeah, so I was going to say, if you don't have a greenhouse, uh, the the bathtub in your house, just <laughs> commandeer that for a couple of weeks. Start your seeds in there. As long as you have some good light because they need light as right. soon as they sprout. We don't want them getting too leggy. We've so, that many so we, <laughs> we plant them. You know, if we're just going, we will honestly sow a lot of our seeds directly in the soil in mid-May. 
And we do that because of just time and space, but we get a first round going earlier in it. When I say greenhouse, it's just a high tunnel. It's not heated or anything. And they do really great in there after the nights are not too cold to let them get cold, frosty or, or frozen. You know, we can start them in there and we just give them time and they sprout up. Um, we So we do a couple of different things with the ones that we have very carefully hybridized and we want to be really sure that their tubers don't get entangled with their neighbors, even from the seedling stage. Um, maybe you want to tell a little about that, about how we do them. Yeah, well, we plant those in a four inch pot <clears throat> so that we, uh, cause we can stick a label right in that pot and there's no question about what the seed parent was and um, what we think the cross is. Uh, the ones that we, uh, uh, we're trying to put into that seed. And then we'll just sink those pots right <laughs> into the ground. So the dahlia oh. tubers grow right in there. They can, um, there's some videos of it on our Instagram, I think, and there's a highlight bubble that talks, shows about it, but they sometimes poke out of those four inch pots. Sometimes they don't, sometimes they just become a little square tuber clump and grow right in there. And then we recycle those plant, we reuse those plant pots. And Yeah, um, we found that's the best way. Actually, we learned that from, from Paul Bloomquist. He, he's the one that showed me that first. And, and he said that the reason why he did it, and this is what we found to be true, if you're, if you're not careful when you plant your, as many as we do, and you plant them as close as everybody wants to plant their seedlings, um, then it's sometimes hard. You see this flower, but it's actually part of a plant that's uh, two seedlings over. But if it's in that pot and you oh. stick that label in there, you know, okay, so this is what I think it is. And then you come back when you're ready to dig it, you can go all the way down there. And the hard thing that Paul does that we don't do yet, we need to start doing when he sees uh, Dahlia that he doesn't like or that he's not going to save year over year, um, he just pulls them right up out of those pots. And that way there's no confusion, but boy, that just feels a little ruthless to us. So we <laughs> generally grow it to the end of the season unless the frost do the dirty work of killing the plant. <laughs> but then we have to label everything super well. So we, yeah, we yeah, plant the them in the field off. and, you know, they're going to grow to be the same size as a regular tuber planted or cuttings planted dahlia. So we make sure that we're prepared to irrigate them when we plant them because we have drought. I know Pacific Northwest is known for its rain, but we actually have drought every summer. Everyone in the Western Washington does, and it's been going like that here for a really long time. It's not a new thing. We have to irrigate our dahlias in the summer or we'll lose them. We also need to be prepared to stake them because they will flop over just like any dahlia will if it's not properly staked and supported. Especially growing from that four inch pot. It uh, needs oh, a little bet. bit more help. Yeah, <clears throat> and we have to fertilize them just like you fertilize your, your dahlias. You know, we, we do all, all the things the same. And then at the end of the season, you can just plant dahlia seeds to enjoy the flowers, to see what you get, to let the bees have a feast all summer long. Um, it's a beautiful border, to, uh, back of your border, because they're the ones that we sell or that Aaron sells are all uh, pretty much tall. You don't, you can get really tiny, small bedding dahlias, but um, you know if you're going to grow a cut flower dahlia, it's going to be tall. Put it in the back of everything else. Give it a good support. Give it lots of direct sunlight. And then at the end of the sing season, to it at night. This is what we like to do too. He does sing to them. <laughs> <laughs> so then, at the end of the season, when the frost comes and kills the tops, we just cut them back, and then we either um, pull we pull the plastic pots out of the ground, and we either throw them out, um, throw the throw the tubers out if we're not going to keep that variety, or we save it, take it out of the pot, we save it over winter, and then we replant it, usually intact the next year if we want to see what it's going to be but you don't have to do that you don't if you don't if you're not a fan of saving tubers you can still grow dahlias from seed and enjoy every second of it we'll sell you seed every single year yeah <laughs> <laughs> i love that i love that so uh, a question so you, when you said that you when you put them in this in a pot much like or a, you know a cell much like a zinnia mm -hmm. that you cover them um how deep do you usually cover them like uh, usually about a half an inch. Yeah. Sometimes it's closer to an inch, but you know, I just, I take my handy dandy pencil and I poke a hole in there and then I put the seed in and I cover it up. So there's about a half inch of, so we like to use potting soil. I'm um, just very straightforward. I mean, if I, if it's a really special value seed, I'm probably going to use black gold potting soil. I don't, they don't pay me either. Maybe they should. I yeah, love black gold potting soil. Fun. It is great. It's fantastic. And it just is like, gives it everything it needs right then at the beginning. You can also start them in seedling mix, but they're going to be hungry. You Real know, quick. 
If you're not direct sowing your dahlias, I don't like to plant them out when they're tiny whiny because slugs love baby dahlias. Like it's like their favorite treat. So I like to give them six to eight weeks before I plant them out if I'm going to plant them as plants. So um, the seed starting mix isn't enough. They're going to need some food. And I have, um, I sent you another link, Scott. I sent you a whole bunch of links. Yeah, we're going <laughs> to share. We're going to try to share. Maybe what we'll do is if you haven't joined our email list, be sure to do that because we're going to put all these kind of links together and send it out so everybody can get uh, a taste of all this great information. So I all appreciate that. All this value that. added for joining Scott's email. That's Thank right. You. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, and more motivation to join yours too. So there you go. Um, and follow okay. along. Um, when you were talking about planting too deep, you were talking about the seeds or you're talking about that pot that we plant the seedling out. Well, actually I was going to get to that, but I was talking about the seed at first. Cause see, I did this okay. thing and I don't know, somebody somewhere did this, you know, suggestion to me and I, I bit and I actually started my first set of seed on a wet paper towel. And I had yeah. that kind of sealed up and then they all germinated and well, they didn't all germinate, but the ones that did germinate, I went ahead and transplanted those into a pot or into like a cell pack or something. Not a, not like the little tiny cell trays, like plugs come in, but more bedding plant kind of size stuff. And then kind of watch to see, okay, which ones were, were thriving and which ones were kind of, you know, not quite as excited. And so, cause I, I didn't have the space to plant everything. So I was really trying to plant the best of the best when I, when, you know, cause if they're, if they're already struggling and they're two inches high, I'm kind of like, okay, you know what? Probably you're going to be, <laughs> you're not going to be my favorite in about yeah. three months. So I, I went ahead and, and, and made the hard decision then. But, um, but I'm glad to know about that. So that's why I was curious how deep you plant the seed. And then when you plant the cut, mm -hmm. so then once that plant develops, it's got roots and everything, then you put that in the pot mm -hmm. and then that's what goes in the yeah, field. That's super smart. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, just full transparency, we do start a whole lot on paper towels and, uh, uh, bags, but we do that just to make sure after I save a lot, uh, uh, a bunch um, from a certain area, I want to make sure my germination is actually I want to make sure it's higher than we promised, but we yeah. promise it's going to be yeah. a certain germination. So I got to make sure that I can actually back up that. Mm -hmm. And so I do a lot of, um, just intermittent testing and, uh, I, I do use that. And if you're only starting, if you're, if you're only going to start, um, 50 or a hundred seeds or a thousand seeds, you know, that's probably that's a funny. good way to do it. Yeah, uh, but it's, it's a great way because then you can select really early and get the best of the best. Yeah, that's a great idea. And one of the links that I sent you, Scott, shows the development in our greenhouse from the from the time that seed is planted from the, really from the time it germinates, what the roots look like in our pots after about 30 days and then what they look like after about 60 days. And if you plant out, you know, 60 days is um, goodness, my brain. It's like it's, it's just like between eight and nine weeks, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I should yeah. be. Yes. Okay. I should be close, <laughs> but, uh, you're going to get little small tubers in some of those seedlings. So if that's you're crazy. selecting for vigor like that, that's another step, another point at which you could select for vigor. If you're going for something that's going to have really great tubers, that doesn't guarantee you anything about the bloom. You could also select for foliage color because from the time a dahlia has its first true leaves, you can see what color its foliage is going to be. Mm. It's going to be chocolate or red or, or green or light green there's a little contest with a couple of our hybridizers they're trying to get a really really good flower on dark foliage because there's a lot of dark foliage out there but and I, again this is very subjective <clears throat> but if you talk to one of my hybridizers he said there's no good flowers except for two on uh this foliage and i and i said well what about uh so-and-so's flowers that lives that's part of our dahlia club and that we're all friends with and they say, yeah, that's no good a flower. So, you know, it's very subjective, <laughs> but uh, they're still trying to get uh, a certain color set to go with that dark because, yeah. uh, you know, you who doesn't want to create something brand new? Doing it, you know, at different stages, your selection in your paper towel, in your, in your tray, you know, just don't be afraid to toss stuff out if you have limited room. That's really smart. Well, you know, when it's you don't tough. have... You gotta when, do it. I know, it's true, but... I, I, 
so I, I won't go down this rabbit trail, but I do know the value of space. And when you don't have an infinite amount of space, you want to make sure you're saving your bit, your, your best for that space. So I want to ask a timing question because if you're, cause I know how these little babies are sensitive to cold. And, and so how many weeks roughly, um, you said a minute ago, nine weeks, 60 days, roughly is mm -hmm. that like before your frost date or do you wait? Cause I know average frost date is just that it's average. So you can obviously right. have frost after that and you want to make sure you're in the clear completely. So how many weeks before your average? Cause I, like I'm getting, I'm like ready to start my seed, but I know that I am probably about four to five weeks from my frost date average. Yeah. So I would say it, you, you're, you should be pretty good to go and ahead and start as long as you have a good light source for them inside, as long as they're not going to get leggy because they're just by a window that doesn't get enough sunlight. Mm -hmm. So we, or, or an old, or an old fluorescent uh, light picture that you've rigged up that gives it enough to germinate in warmth, but doesn't really give it enough light. Yeah. We, for years, we started them like that, just struggled to keep them from getting so leggy. So. Yeah. Well, well, you're talking about years. For lots of years, I was like, our our last, our first, what is it? Last frost date is usually April fifteenth. So, so April sixteenth, we're planting. You yeah, know, I was, yeah, I was, yeah. I think of myself being like young and hungry. I wanted to plant those back in. So and the now, bathtub was off limit. Yeah. Um, uh, late February, no more baths. <laughs> it fixated on the bath. Okay, I, one time Steve grew ducks in our bathtub, and I'm telling you what, that was more farm life than I bargained for. <laughs> Yeah, I've raised, I've raised ducks. I've raised ducks. Oh, yeah. You know. I, I, yeah, we we had them in uh in our garage, and that was, um, yeah, that was a thing. So that's we're, good enough. Yeah, that was. There, there's still some complaint to this day. People in my family swear they can still smell the ducks in the bath. I don't think that's true, but I think it might be. I'm gonna have to redo the bathroom before <laughs> before too much longer. So, I say. Plant your dahlias out six to eight weeks. I'm really aiming for six, but then I'm watching my weather forecast like a hawk. And if it's if it's anywhere below 40 at night for me, I'm not putting those dahlias out. And really in most climates, by the time, so I, I'm looking to plant mine around May 1st. In most places in the United States, not certainly not all, but in lots of places in the Midwest and the South, by the 1st of May, you're in the 50s at night. So you're not, or, or higher in the South. So you're not having to worry about it too much. So you know, rule of thumb for me is May 1st. And I would start, if anyone that I wanted to plant as plants, I would start about six weeks before that. And you can cheat by putting up little, um, putting Horp Nova or um, uh, Frost Claw yeah. on top of it. Just if you think it's, it's going to get cold, leave that mm -hmm. thing off uh, until um, right around, right before supper time, close it up, <laughs> trap all that heat in there. And, but uh, really it, uh, that Dahlia seed is going to flower for us, it's only, it's an average of 95 days after germination. So unless you have a super, super short season, you're, you can elastic. plant those dahlias quite late and still see what their bloom looks like. I, you don't have plenty of time. Yes, absolutely. I don't pinch our seedlings before they bloom that first flower because I'm a really impatient girl and I want to see what does that flower look like? But then once I see it and get a good picture of it, I doesn't always look like the ones that are coming later, right? First dahlias are often wonky. So we get a picture of it just so we can remember. And then I give it a really good cut. That dahlia might only be 20 inches tall, but I'm cutting six to eight inch stem on that. I wanna put it in a vase and watch what it does, keep my records. I don't put them all in a vase. That would be crazy. I don't have enough room, just the best ones in a vase to watch. But I, we pinch them thin. Then that keeps them from getting super tall and super lanky and also gives them a chance to put some energy into their roots. And then we get lots more blooms later. But that first flower comes about three three months and maybe a week or two after, you, after it germinates. So there have been plenty of times when we ran out of time to get all of them planted in May. And so we were planting them in June and we, we had flowers by the end of August, which still gave me plenty of, oh, hold on, that's not true. Yeah, you know, it is because oh, yeah. we had, we had, they were plants, so we were planting out. Yeah. Dress sowing in June would give you flowers by the end of September, which for most people is still fine enough to see what a bloom looks like and then go from there. Yeah, we well, get some of our best blooms late September. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Well, um, I know we've talked about the legacy program on um, our last episode that we did. And so for people who don't know, if you want to explain that, that'd be great. But I'm really excited because I know you have started a novice sort of hybridizing program, which I think opens a much bigger gateway for some fabulosity to come through, you know, to, to make its way to the, the front of the line, so to speak, or at least in the pack. So tell us about that. Well, do you want to explain really quick the legacy program, the bones of what that is? Yeah, uh, for those of you who don't know, since we've been beating this drum for the last couple of years, probably the last, uh, I don't know, we started, started in 19? We started in 18. We started 18. paying people in 19 because we yeah, yeah. got to the season of selling. Yeah. yeah. Started talking a big game in 18, and then I actually sent them money in 19. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, just to consolidate what the legacy program is, it's just um, us building a royalty in to any tuber that I sell. Um, we're saving a portion of that and it's going back to the person who originated it. Now, there are a couple of, there's a couple of different ways. Um, well, there, there's some values that the originators are not around and we still grow those, but slowly, um, what's happening is the values that we grow, uh, we're phasing out all the ones that we don't have a relationship with the hybridizer and we are replacing it with uh, varieties that um, our new friends are growing. And it's a pretty slow process. Like we're not gonna stop selling yeah. Cornell Bronze oh, no. until we have a really awesome copper yeah. value to replace it. We're not trying to be radical about this, but slowly but surely we're doing that. And the, the purpose of it is we're trying to help legacy hybridizers grow out large quantities of their dahlias yeah. because many of them are backyard gardeners and they can't grow 500 or a thousand or 1500 of their dahlias to sell. It would take all of their time and energy. And so we do that for them. We market it. We put it in the online store. We do everything for them so that all they have to do is create and then reap the benefits of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Originally it was um, just me trying to surround myself with these uh, uh, folks that are in their seventies and eighties that had forgotten more about growing values than I had yet to learn. And so talking with them, I saw that they were these great hybridizers that were fantastic growers, but they're in their eighties or they're in their late seventies and they, they don't want to grow 200 Bloomquist Allen. Uh, we do, yeah. <laughs> and we want to grow all the special ones that he created that everybody wants. We're doing it at a, a, a at a at a scale that when they go for sale, they don't, they're not sold out in the first two minutes, and um, that is uh, so. That's our legacy program, yeah. and kind of out of that developed the idea of doing a novice hybridizer program because there are people out there we know who are growing amazing hybrids, and they're at the same time developing an amazing following on social media and in their newsletter, and they are setting themselves up perfectly to begin selling their hybrids when they're ready. But there are other people who plant a seed and get an amazing dahlia and for, for any number of reasons don't have those things set up and they're not equipped to sell them for themselves. So we're trying to remove barriers to market for those people. So I wrote down the barriers, so I'll remember barriers. them all. Okay. It might just be that they're new to the process or it might be that they, like many of our legacy program hisers don't have room to grow out large quantities or yeah or they just yeah. don't want to i mean uh you know i think that's one thing that uh christine alvara uh she she doesn't want to go into the tuber selling business but she would love everybody to have her dahlias and so great yeah some of our hybridizers definitely have room yeah. paul is yeah. growing and his son thomas are growing lots of their dahlias at um north is it north cascades um, it had a different name and now it has, it's, it's yeah. a beautiful farm and he's mm -hmm. got plenty of room, but we're still getting to distribute some of his values for him. And, um, our friends, Sandy and Steve Bowley oh, from yeah. Birch Bay values, they also have room, but they don't, they just don't, it's not in their plan to grow out hundreds and hundreds of values. And so we're doing that. We're trying, we're inviting people to the novice hybridizer program who don't have room for that, or they, they don't have an existing customer base or they don't have customer support or marketing or shipping team and they don't want to figure it all out, you know? So our goal is to say, um, you can apply to this. If you're, if you, if you've grown, we have a lot of requirements. Like you have to have grown your dahlia for 
certain number of years and you have to have kept really good records and you have to have pictures and you have to certify that it is indeed yours. You can take it from someone, you know, all the things right. so we're doing all the best that we can. So then um, this year is our first year to do it. We've been talking about it since 2021. This is our first year that we're implementing it. We have just eight values in the program from five new hybridizers. And we just, um, we just sent out an email that showed all their pictures of all their dahlias and told their working name and their name and their hometown and just sort of starting to whet people's appetite. I just am really excited to see what will happen as we grow their flowers at our farm and invite our legacy program hybridizers to weigh in and evaluate them and give them just gobs and gobs of feedback on all the parts like how does this dahlia grow in the Pacific Northwest? What kind of timbers does it make? Um, how is the social media reception to it, just all the things you can imagine. And then I think, I mean, I don't, I don't know. We haven't grown any of these yet, but if all goes according to plan, we'll be able to grow large quantities and release all eight and pay those hybridizers a big, huge chunk of royalties, just like we do to our legacy program hybridizers. And then um, they'll be able, lots of people will have it in their garden and it'll be a variety that's out in the world instead of um, them just maybe distributing it to their friends or a local Dahlia club or it would grow much, it would be distributed way slower in that manner. So we're excited to see how this benefits folks. We don't, we're going to see, someone asked me just this week, well, can you be in the program two years in a row? And honestly, I don't know. <laughs> we haven't gotten there yet. I think, <laughs> sure. <or what? laughs> but we're just, we're learning as we go. We have a really great class of 2024 that's being so patient with us as we learn and grow and um, super exciting to see what they're coming up with. And we get first dibs on the new dahlias. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's so fun. I cannot wait to make bouquets of some of these and like show how they look with other dahlias and put that on social media and let everyone yeah. see. It's just such a fun thing. Yeah. Well, one thing yeah, I, I love about this, though, is I, I feel like, you know, there are some people I think about Christine and I'm like, we... We would not, I don't know how you guys feel, but I would never want her to hit the brakes at all on what she's doing. I don't want her to waste one hour of a day trying to figure out how to scale her varieties up and mass produce it because I want her focused on that genetics that she's developing and continues to develop because she's got a great eye and, and she's just one of many people I know, but, um, but I'm, yeah, I just, we're gonna, yeah. Be a few more of those folks stick around. <laughs> and well, I mean, I, if, yeah. you, if it gives you great joy to grow, to create a Dahlia and grow out hundreds. I mean, I can think of several, I don't want to call names because I don't know exactly how soon they're, beginning to distribute their values, but if it gives you joy to do that and it's your life's calling, then you should do that. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's yeah. not, if, if you're, if your calling is to create, then I'm excited to run alongside of you and help you get to where you need to be to distribute. Yeah. I love that. But, um, you were going to read off. Was that all the barriers you were talking about? Yes. If you can think of more barriers, please tell me, cause I'll put them on this list <laughs> right now. <laughs> this is the main one because I think these are the these were the hardest things for us to accomplish as Dahlia sellers. Customer support is a huge deal. If someone yeah. doesn't hear back from you quickly, then it, they, it feels very personal. They and, think you don't like them, and that's not true. <laughs> they do like you. Shipping in an organized way is super important so that you don't waste a lot of money on sending people the wrong thing, or they don't ship at the wrong time, or you don't ship product too slowly. You, you know, there's or you don't protect it enough. Less. There's just a ton of yeah. things that it takes a long time to learn to do it really well. So there's a lot of stuff we learned the hard way. Yeah. And uh, a lot of mistakes save, we've made. Yeah, yeah. Save people from making that. And quite frankly, uh, it is, um, it, it's just interesting to see some people who have this huge potential, but they don't know where to get started. And so this is a great place, even if you want to sell Dahlia tubers and sell <clears throat> fresh cut flowers and all the whole thing that goes along with the, uh, the whole farmer florist thing. That's, that's open to you, but this gives you another, another option. way to sell them because yeah. you know, there's, yeah, it's good. Sell a lot of tubers. I feel like scaling to, to, so I think the first year we shipped dahlias, we might've shipped, I don't know, 1500 dahlias. And it was incredibly hard because we didn't, we were muddling through figuring it out, it out as we went. And then I think by the time we got to 2020, so I think just yesterday was the anniversary of the day we found out that our employees weren't allowed to be 
we had there was a very strong um stay safe safe stay home push in washington state washington state, and for yeah. non uh what's not or, what's the word not it was urgent, non-essential, essential, workers. non-essential so, workers as a flower farm we technically didn't apply and we wanted our folks to stay healthy anyway so we ended up shipping that whole year by ourselves and that was a long couple of weeks like most long of america hours. we were homeschooling on a dime and you know shipping and it was it just helped us realize, okay, this is not feasible. This can't scale beyond this if it's just us. And right. so, and there was a point to where we did all that stuff, and we're excited to do it all. But yeah. we we hit that limit um, way, way earlier than we should have. Uh, we should have stopped. But so we had a crew before that, and then all of a sudden we were by ourselves, and it just sort of solidified in my mind. Okay. This is virtually impossible for people to do without a without a crew, without a support around them helping them do this. Not just the putting tubers in boxes, the hands that put the tubers in the boxes, but the hands that think about uh, logistics and the the minds and fingers that type replies to customer service and someone who has to call the UPS when a package goes. I mean USPS right. when a package goes missing or whatever. So that was all. You know that's why in 2021 we started thinking about this program and it's fun to see it come to fruition and we hope that it's really useful to our class of 2024. I think there's a blog post too about it that shows all of their variety and tells a little bit more about what we're doing. So we're well, excited. I love this idea of the class of 2024. I think that's a great way to, you know, because then people can kind of follow along uh, a little, a little differently. You know, one of the things I think you mentioned at the beginning when we were sort of encapsulating what you guys do, I think you mentioned cuttings. So are you guys doing cuttings now too, or how's that? I mean, what's, is this a new development? Yeah. Yeah. So we've done cuttings for a long time for our own, benefit just to increase our stock right. um but the the thing that we've recently started doing um is is really propagating them uh where they're in a sterile environment so the the virus has kind of gotten out of control in the daily world um uh, uh, but this this gives us a, another tool to get past it so we can we can actually run it through a, a, a virus elimination program, and um, then we have it tested. There's a panel of tests, so they they test for, I think there's twelve or fifteen viruses they test, and um, yeah, that's the long and the short of it. Is yes, we are doing a massive amount of cuttings, and uh, we are doing it so that they're all negative. For, uh, for the viruses everybody's scared about. We're scared about too, because as as we go through our field uh, once a day, um, you know, there's there's a lot of dahlias out there. And as careful as you are, uh, as careful as I think we are and our crew, there's always one or two that slips through. And then, you know, then you, then you got problems. So one of the things that's really cool to us about the rooted cuttings and doing them through tissue culture is that we are able to do that virus testing to make sure that the products when we ship them from the farm are free from a lot of dahlias uh, viruses. They're not free from dahlias. They are 100% dahlia. Then we, but we also can multiply them way more quickly than we could just with traditional yeah. cuttings and certainly more quickly than with tubers. So it means that we can get more. Um, all So this year we just came into the market with 10 dahlias that are in this rooted cuttings program. And they're all from our legacy program. So we'll be paying royalties to those hybridizers for every one we sell. We're selling a significantly higher amount of rooted cuttings than we are tubers because we can just make more. Yeah. So um, we're, we're about to ship. We, we did ship to our garden members last year as a trial. Um, we shipped rooted cuttings to them and they we just had a really great experience. Everyone really loved them. We learned a lot about what days of the week to ship them and just, trying to figure it out, but we're going to be shipping a lot of cuttings here in the next couple of weeks. So we're going to start here. Actually, it's spring that our next spring is here, Scott. I know. That's what's scaring me. That's why I was like, yeah. <laughs> I've got to get my dye seed started. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Well, you know, yeah. but, but the idea of the cuttings, I think is just a great thing. So you're going to have 12 varieties and they're all legacy but, varieties that mm-hmm. you're going to be starting with. Yep, it's just 10 varieties right now. Oh, 10, we okay. have four more that are ready to go, but we're we're not going to be selling them this year. Yeah. We have and there's 40 top 40, yeah, right? There's 40 in the program, but there again, if so we tested 
and then we had somebody else test it, and then we also used a uh, another party. And if there's any blip on that radar, we we just held it back. Because yeah. if there's even a sometimes in a, in a, a lot of folks might have used the egg data test. We we've, we've used the egg data tests uh, personally for for years now. And um, the interesting story is one time we got uh, uh, a customer returned that said, hey, there was virus in this. So, we, okay, we refunded them and we saved that one because we were doing a class later that year. And we saved it. it we was isolated in, it. We wanted an example yeah, of Dahlia yeah. that had a virus, right? So we're giving this uh, class, we're doing this education and we're, we're saying, okay, so this is what a disease plant looks like. And here's how you do the test. And, we and perform it, the test. It's going to show up a positive for this. Um, I can't remember. I think it was mosaic. I don't, like, I don't think. Some I think it looked, I will tell you that over the summer, this plant did improve greatly in yeah. health as we cared for it. And by the time we got to the Yeah, workshop, and here we are up in front of all of our uh, workshop attendees. We're saying, this is a, yeah, I know it looks good, but we've already tested it. It's, it's, a, it's got a virus. And then we and ran the test. We couldn't get it to test positive. We ran. We okay. We we need another test. So we got oh another gosh! Test. Did it several times, and we said, "So like, uh, okay, put it on a dime." So this is yeah. what could happen. Yeah. We, we don't know what's happening, folks. So yeah, yeah. So, so we failed at providing you a virus sample. Yeah. It's clean, actually. Positive tests. So oh. just because we know the way uh, this whole thing works, and um, uh, I've had the, I've had the benefit of talking to some virologists and some people that are this is their life work uh, right. testing plant, uh, virus in plants. They are they're adamant about using certain language and uh, just all the steps that they take. And so uh, just in talking to them and talking with other good um, established uh, uh, growers, we we just if there's if there's any question in the series of tests that we do we just hold it out till we can get past that then we're then we're going to have all confidence to say it was there was no viruses it, yeah. it tested negative for everything uh when we sent it your so way we test in our field with our data tests regularly and we are very careful to observe and pull things that aren't aren't there and we started our cuttings program with our data tests but now we're using um what is that yeah we're using meristem cutting so no no the name of the test the, the special test that we sent it off to do. Uh, well, there's a couple. There's a couple. There's yeah. a specific word for it. It's escaping my mind right now. But we sent it to Agdia for them to do specific other tests that you can't just do at home. You have to do it under a oh, electron microscope. Yeah, they're checking for amino acids. I don't Amazing. remember exactly, but <laughs> maybe we maybe edit that not thought. No. <laughs> yeah. No, but we're trying to, we're just trying to do our best to make sure that even if there is like a microgram of, of something showing up that we're, um, we're waiting till we can get that completely clean. And you have to do multiple tests. Even, right. even if you get one that says, yes, you're all clear, you got to get to back that up with another one. So we're mm -hmm. using two different, uh, ways to test it so that we feel that that's extra helpful. Uh, sure. it's extra helpful for us. And I think in turn, mm -hmm. Even though it's a little slower and it's certainly more money, it's gonna it's gonna provide a better end product, which yeah. is our goal. Right, and that is right. honestly the bottom line why we're starting with ten and then forty, and we have seven hundred named varieties at our farm. It would be fantastic if we could sell seven hundred named varieties of dahlias. By by the time we're done with these hybridizers, we're gonna have way more than seven hundred. So it would but, be nice if we could if we could afford seven hundred. The uh, uh, different tests. That's the yes. issue. Yeah, we are we are slowly working working our way through. We're pouring um, money back into our business so that we can grow it stronger and we can deliver exciting new pro products to our customers. Now, I'm curious about a couple of things that you were talking earlier. I'm kind of talking about two different things here. One is if yeah, it's what we do. Um, if you're tr if you if you are suspect if you suspect yeah, can't talk. If you suspect that um, you might have a potential issue that you're trying to evaluate, okay? Because I know that if it's a no, if it's if it's a de definite infected plant, you're going to toss it or something. But like, how far away can you plant that plant and it not really impact your field? Or do you can you even do that because of the insects and different things like that that are vectors for virus 
Yeah, uh, insects are the biggest vector for transferring virus. So uh, everybody hates to get frips. Uh, you, right. you hate to get, uh, we, we don't really have a problem with um, potato bugs where we are, uh, Japanese beetles, but I mean, they chew on that plant and they fly to the next one because you mm -hmm. shoo it away and don't kill it and, and it escapes. And <laughs> then it's taken that with them. So if it's, if it's got the... Um, so, I mean, I don't know that there is a safe answer to your question, Scott, okay. because if, if, if your neighbor over the fence has bought tomatoes from a big box store that has tomato mosaic virus and the ants take the aphids from their tomatoes and bring it over to your dahlias, you know, and then they're farming their aphids. You get virus. Right. So, I mean, even if you had a plant that you were trying to um, isolate, you might not be able to prevent other it's not just your neighbor don't pick on your neighbor yeah. <laughs> it's just it's endemic in, in nature right right so right. it can be growing in a hedgerow that you're uh, right that you're growing so because we're dahlia tuber sellers we do throw lots of dahlias away we try to make sure that we anything that looks funny we just do away with it but if you i feel like just just like in a person, if I'm exposed to a virus and I generally am a healthy person, I have a good diet, I sleep well, I have a strong immune system, whatever the things are that you met, you use to measure health, I'm less likely to succumb to that virus than um, if I am already sick, you know, or if I've already got a low, lowered immune system. So I feel like it's the same for plants. You know, this, if you're keeping your plants free from weeds, so that there is not a, a vector right by them for plants to just have a super highway right. I mean, bugs to have a super highway right to your dahlias. Keeping the weeds away if you're giving them good nutrition, if you're giving them plenty of sunlight, and if you're giving them plenty of water. And, and maybe it's oh, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> sing to them. No, but then you're less likely for them to succumb to a virus than than if they're already an alien plant. And if you like, so we we understand that we grow dahlias. Uh, <clears throat> differently than a lot of people so we have, I have greenhouses so i can put them in there you can't bugs can't get in there uh mm -hmm. that's the purpose of this greenhouse it's, an, it's a special kind of greenhouse. yeah yeah and you got to go in one door and then open another door so mm -hmm. it's 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 not quite as uh uh involved as the you know the the, the virologists that go in and out of the horror movies <laughs> transferring the viruses but you know it's the next step because uh working in the field and then coming in there and then coming back out in the field. Right. We just, we can't take that chance if right. we're going to. So if we do, we, we just don't even do that anymore, really. We, we actually take it off site. Yeah. Uh, that's the only way that we feel secure. But if a person mm -hmm. wanted to do that and they just got Christine's newest release, well, they wouldn't have a virus on her new release. Yeah, no, no, no of course not. <laughs> no, uh, we're not being sarcastic. They wouldn't. They're being very, no. very careful. No, I know that. Yeah. But I mean, but things happen yeah. though. And and your and right. your neighbor's tomato plant, you know, we're going to blame your neighbor. You know, that whole yeah. thing, you know, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, it happens though. And so that's why I bring yeah. it up. But I, but I can appreciate that stance that, you know, it's just, it's better. I mean, I've had to make that hard call where I'm like, okay, let's just get it off site. Let's just get rid of it. Um, I know last year, I think I've already shared on the podcast that I felt like I had some virus and some of mine, but I didn't have that many and I really wasn't planning on saving them. So I let them kind of do their thing and they kind of grew out of it and they kind of, mm -hmm. they still performed really well. And so I don't think it's necessarily a death sentence. It really depends on, are you selling plants? Are you selling tubers? You know, you don't want to sell that kind of material, but if it's for your own personal enjoyment and you're cutting flowers and bringing them in, you know, as a gardener or a hobbyist, then I think, you know, okay, not the end of the world. Yeah. So just to put it in perspective. Well, yeah, it might be virus may not be. That's one of the biggest exactly. um, things. Yeah. If you're not testing it, there's no way that you can, I mean, you can look at all the pictures on the internet and you say, oh, well, I think I got this. Well could be a magnesium deficiency or could be magnesium, uh, yeah. a cultural, be magnesium some cultural. deficiency. Right. Yeah. 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 There's all kind of stuff. Or there could be uh, a bug that chewed on it. You don't see that there's a little discoloration that way. And that would cause you to be alarmed. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's bringing, um, what's the, what's Leafy the gall or something? Yeah. Oh, that's a bacteria, but you know. Yeah, the gall are a bacteria. Yeah. But that can be transferred via bugs too. That actually, yeah, anyway. 
But anyway, we are so, about that if we need so to. <laughs> one of the things, yeah. So one of the things I wanted to briefly touch on, um, I know we're kind of getting towards the end here, but um, when we were talking earlier, you made the decision to not have your Dahlia Festival this year. And yeah, I know that's right? got to be a bummer for a lot of people. And that had to be an incredibly difficult decision. Um, and I, I'd love to hear uh, kind of your heart on this and kind of what's going on. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I feel like that had to be a major decision. Yes, it was. And it's still hard to, I'm like, what? We're not having Dahlia Festival? It washes <laughs> over me, you know? <laughs> she keeps saying, no, no, we may still do it. Nope. Yeah. We've already sent the emails out. Uh, right. This year, we're not doing it. Yeah. And, and, and it's for a couple of reasons. We need we need time to build infrastructure at our farm. We're planting in a different field this year. We need time for our family. Our kids are just about, well, at least one of them is about to fly the coop. And we just need yeah. time. Yeah, fun is driving, Scott. <laughs> we need time. It's crazy you know, yeah. to rest and all, you know, we have a few family things going on, but um, not bad things, just things, you know, so yeah. we just, and also it's well, just. Yeah. And we normally have a festival where we grow, I've got about a six acre field up front that we split up into a couple of different sections. <clears throat> and again, just, we don't, we don't have to do this, but we're not growing any dahlias up front. So I've, we've got quite a bit of property in the back. And uh, we're moving our fields all to the back. So I am uh, restoring that field. So we're growing a couple of different cover crops that I think will really help us uh, add some fertility back in the set soil. We have, we have the coveted soil for our county because the raspberry growers love to grow, grow on it. Things grow mm -hmm. great, uh, but it does have some downsides to it. And making sure that we've regenerated our soil is a big priority for mm -hmm. us. And so... Yeah, there's there's a lot of reasons like that. So if you if you uh, we're not, we're we're not inviting anybody to come, but if you do happen to drive past our farm uh, this summer, you'll think, oh no, what happened to the dahlia farm? <laughs> All the flowers are gone. It's the only hiding thing... behind the cedar trees. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even but, think we're growing. We're not even growing annuals. Up there. Well, there will probably be some annuals. So. A little well, bit of annuals. <laughs> We can't help ourselves. The, the <laughs> other thing, too, and I, I wish I could say that we always think about everything in the right order. This is not the case. We're, we're actually very much human. And we just sometimes make decisions because they're best for our family and, and our farm. And then realize also, oh, this other thing is very true. And that is that we, we don't have to do the Dahlia Festival to be a successful flower farm. We sometimes think, I think it's very easy for me to think, oh, we have to do this because we've always done it. And honestly, the Dahlia Festival is it breaks even it's not a you know a super big profitable part of our business plan if we're just thinking of it like that it is a huge part of what makes what we look forward to and what we enjoy like seeing all these people enjoy our values and getting to see people we don't see any other time of the year so that is a big part of it if you're thinking about the emotional part of it but it's it's probably really good for us to take a break and just do some other things that we want to do really dig into these novice hybridizers and build our legacy program and not not just think, oh, we have to do this thing. We've always done it, but look at it more objectively as business people. I think that's really smart. Yeah. We don't have to do all the things. We didn't think of that at the beginning. So I'm not saying we were smart, but in retrospect, oh, that was smart. Yeah. And that's what we're going to tell everybody. We're going to tell everybody this is to improve our work-life balance. Well, that is true. There's no lie about that. Yeah. That's, so, well, well, I think that's important. Question, there you go. Yeah. No, but I think that's important because you know, a lot of times we do, we go through the motions, don't we, of doing the things because we've always done the things and there might be a, a good reason to take a break for it for a year, you know, to build infrastructure or, you know, okay, you're being sensitive to perhaps needs your family has coming up and, and you want to be present right. for that. And, um, right. and uh, I would say to anyone who is a yeah. flower farmer who's listening, you know, you can take a year off, your business will still be there. No, the, the vacuum is that you leave is not going to be completely filled. You are uniquely fit to do the job that you're doing. So I would say, don't, um, my dog's bringing me the notes I put on the floor. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't hesitate to take a break when you need it and make sure that you're staying healthy so that you can do your, do the work you're called to do for longer. Yeah. Sure. You know, that's one, not to derail us, but we just, uh, we have the privilege of speaking at the Utah, um, what was that? Thing? It was a flower conference there. Yeah, flower conference yeah. for the Utah uh, specialty flower growers. 
Hey, Utah. Good to see well, you. Well, honestly, Scott, I think a lot of people from that conference said, hey, we heard you on the Flower Podcast. Okay. So all you friends, all you new friends, hi. Yay. I'm calling you out. Yeah, but one of the things, everybody was so gracious and say, hey, we appreciate this, this, and this, and this. But I, I think overwhelmingly, the thing that that more people told us, uh, hey, you giving us, you encouraging us to not compare ourselves to another grower or to <clears throat> an expectation for what a grower does, uh, very helpful. You encouraging us to make sure that we not only kept our soil healthy, but kept our physical health and our family balance uh and so essentially yeah yeah, essentially they said uh stuff like thank you for giving us permission to be emotionally healthy not just Mm -hmm. business healthy and i don't know why we need permission from someone to do that but sometimes we do i you know it took us a long time to take a break from this festival we've been having this this would have been our 11th year so we've we we had it in another location alongside another event if we count all those years it would have been our 11th one in a row and it would have been really, really neat to do it, but we're gonna we're gonna just yeah. take it one day at a time. We mainly are just saying this to everybody else because we need to hear it. Yeah, stuff. that's the and point. this is the big line in the sand. Okay, we're gonna practice what we preach. <laughs> we're not gonna have those those big events this year. Yeah, but well, hang on, they'll be back. And they'll be back. Well, I think you yeah. know. I just I feel like so many times we. Um, it's funny that that was one of the res- those were the responses you got at that conference because uh and i'm gonna blame social media for this i feel like you know we're so busy trying to be somebody else and we don't realize okay well they're in a different situation a different zone they're in a different Mm -hmm. area of the country whatever and you know season of life yeah 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 Yeah. season of life exactly and Mm -hmm. it's okay i mean i think about um a lot of times you know like my family where we're at right now, you know, my kids are, are, are much older and they are at a time where, you know, you think you always think that, um, you know, as your kids get older, that they need you less, they may act like that, but they don't. And it's, it's, and as a, as you know, I don't think you ever stop being a parent and that's okay. And I feel like, you know, it's, it's important to not just assume and, but to be present. And, um, I'm excited for you guys that you are, um, are doing that and taking a step back. Um, I gotta ask this question though, because you, you said this about your cover crops. What are you planning for your cover crops on that front, that front part of the property? Well, we're having crop. an ongoing argument yeah. about this, so thanks for bringing that up. Okay, my pl- okay, we love drama on the Flower Podcast. I'm planting it all. If it was up to me, I would plant oats and sunflowers as soon as those sunflowers could be drilled into the field, and then chop them in in June and plant more sunflowers, so we'll have a big field of sunflowers in the fall. But somebody else has other ideas. So guys, on social media, you're going to know who wins based on what you see on social media. <laughs> What is your well, plan? There, there will be sunflowers out there, and that'll be we'll finish with sunflowers because um, I, I'm actually going to let them go to seed, and so um, for us that's not a catastrophe because of the kind of climate we live in. Some people might hear that and think you're creating so many sunflower weeds, but for us no, it will those, be fine. Those are the, those are great weeds yeah. to have because <laughs> as we're uh, redoing our soil next spring, we'll say, "Yep, that's a sunflower. That's a sunflower. That's a sunflower. No question about what it is. It's not. You're not going to confuse it with a dahlia coming out of the soil." Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we have a we have pretty cold nights throughout the summer, so we could get away with sowing red clover later than most folks. Mm-hmm. So we, what we're trying to do is in that super sandy, sandy, porous soil, we're trying to do a massive increase in organic matter. Um, we have really great earthworm activity. We have really great fertility up there, but we're just trying to give it a rest. This will be the um, 60, 17, 18, 19, 20, 23. This would be the, the ninth year that we planted in that field. I think we probably should have given it a, we give it a rest in chunk, yeah. but we're just giving the whole thing a rest now. Because we always move it. So if I, if I plant uh, in our beds are, our beds are just shy of 30 inches. <clears throat> uh, that's the prep soil. And then we have grass in between everything. Um, and this so will also be a chance. What's that? Clover and rye and, yes. you know, good grass. But this will give me a chance to get rid of some of those perennial weeds. <laughs> some things we grow some stuff that put a root down. Good night. Like, 
I think it goes down. It seems like it goes down 10 feet. I don't <laughs> think it does do that, but you can pull that. I'll see when those things are popping up and I just know, okay, let this, this spot in this field, we're going to be weeding all, all summer because you pull up a weed and it, it leaves a knot underneath and it just keeps reproducing. So I'm going to be able to work those, uh, um, that area later in the season because I won't have to worry about disturbing dahlias or right. roses or right. We bought our farm in 2016 and it had been uh, vacant or fallow for about seven years. It was a foreclosure. And a um, polite way of so saying that, it's a foreclosure. <laughs> those those folks those not folks, sorry, the 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 field was just weeds. Just seven, yeah. sure. seven years of weeds. Yeah. And so we've been trying to overcome that a little along. We've made a lot of progress, but we're excited we'll to make more. We'll stack our weed bed up next to anybody. We have strong <laughs> <new> weeds. <laughs> well and we have some of the coolest things that well you don't want to hear about our weeds, but we got a, some cool prehistoric looking weeds. We have lots of awesome. edible weeds. Yeah, we're enjoying do. that. But anyway. Yeah. Well, it's funny. We I just fight our crew for some of them. The episode we had um, last week, or well, I guess when this releases, will be two weeks ago, with Jenny Love. She was talking about how oh, the okay. weeds, the weeds help tell you what's going on in your soil because certain oh, weeds do certain things, and they're it's your soil. You know, I think she was mentioning dandelions bring potassium up into yeah. the root zone and stuff like all these things. I'm like, I never knew that. I mean, I'm like, um, gosh, so I guess if so weeds cool. could talk, we would, we would be a lot smarter, but, um, yeah. That's yeah. That. There's it, really, what is a weed, Scott? Right. Do you want to know the definition of a weed at triple run farm? Sure. The definition of our definition of a weed is a plant growing out of place. That's wow. It. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, in the spring, there's we, there's a lot of them that I make salads out of. And uh, again, I fight our crew because they're like, oh no, you know, we'll take it. I'm like, okay, you can take that home. But we harvest a lot of those. Uh, so that's the benefit for our weeds. And then, of course, there's different ones. Like you mentioned, the, the dandelion, there is some benefit that way. Yeah. So um, this just lets us do it on a macro scale where I can do six acres. Uh, all at once and uh, grow quite a few different things. Some of them, you know, some of the reasons sunflower is some of the things it does to the soil. We're excited about that. Some of the, the yarrow and some of the other things that we're going to plant. So I guarantee you our cover crop, it doesn't get to go to seed uh, until the last one will be the sunflower. But if we let it go to seed, it would be the best looking cover crop you ever <laughs> did see. Maybe we'll just transition to a wildflower meadow. Yeah. Farm. It's going to be a weed grower. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, you know, on the West Coast, there's a lot of those. So that's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so... no, those, those, some of those bigger growers are our friends and we, we, we'll let them do what they do. We'll do what we do. <laughs> so. Well, guys, it's been fun catching up and thank you. Thank you for what you're doing um, to encourage these hybridizers and, and, getting, you know, kind of coming alongside them to help us get some of these fabulous little treasures all the quicker. So thank you. And thanks for being on the flower podcast. Thanks for having us, Scott. And thanks for doing what you do. We love following along all the different folks you talk to and just love to see the, the beauty you bring to the world with this podcast. Thanks for having us. And it's a uh, nice uh, to have you in my ear as I'm out weeding the fields. Yeah. <laughs> 